there's some power here today. There's some power here today. You need to take a moment, friend, and I don't know what it is. I don't know if you've got something that hinders you. But I'm telling you, there's a freedom that's available today. Not because of anything we do, but because of who He is. I don't know what it is that you may have that you wrestle with. But right now is the moment where you give it to God. You give it to God. Because it's not yours to carry. You have a cross to carry, but it's not these problems that you deal with. It's not the life circumstances that you struggle with. That's God's. That's God's. Give it to Him right now. Father God, I don't know what everybody struggles with. Lord, I know what I struggle with. And Father God, that is not mine to carry. I carry the cross of Christ. I carry the burden of the gospel. I carry your work, Lord God. That's our job. But Father God, you are the one who carries us. You are the one who carries our need. You're the one who carries our infirmities. You're the one who carries our lack. You're the one who said, I will supply. You are the one who said, I will watch over. You are the one who said, I will guide. You are the one who said, I will provide in your desert. You are the one that, Lord God, said you would save and deliver and heal us. So, Father God, we come to you with everything, every chain that binds us, every chain that we drag around that we don't have to because Hebrews says we can lay those chains aside. Every sin that so easily entangles us, we can lay it aside and be free in the name of Jesus. Father God, we lay those things down because what we have need of is you right now. What we have need of is you right now. And Father God, I speak healing in this house. I speak freedom in this house. I speak deliverance from the enemy in this house, Lord God. That whatever the need is, it is not met because I feel like it. It's met because I know it. I know in whom my Christ is has the, what he's delivered me from. I know that my God raised his son up from the dead. I know that I am delivered because he was delivered from death, hell, and the grave. I am too. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. For on Christ's solid rock I stand all other ground it's just sinking sand oh come on I think I hear some chains falling come on I think I hear some chains falling here today I hear the chains falling oh God deliver us deliver us I hear oh. the chains falling Yes, I do. In your name, Jesus. And I hear the chains falling. Hallelujah. I hear the chains falling. Oh, come on. Come on. I hear the chains falling. Oh, let it go, Lord. In the name, Jesus. Drop them off. Somebody in faith, because we do not do this Christ life journey by what we feel. We do it by what we know. And we know that where two or three are gathered together, he's in the house. We know that when two or three gather together on anything, it's done. 
So here's what we need to do, church. Tell him thank you. And Lord God, in an attitude of faith, we say thank you because I believe chains fall. I believe right now chains have fell. I believe that right now there are people going to leave here today freer than how they came in. They're going to leave here with a new mindset. Matter of fact, they're going to leave with a made-up mind. I am victorious. I have overcome. My God has met my need. That doesn't matter if I haven't heard the report yet. I know the report of the Lord. He says I am saved and delivered and healed. He says that I am set free. He says that there is no condemnation for those who are in Him. I am free from the chains I had. And I am becoming freer still. God, we give you the glory and the praise and the honor right now. In Jesus' name. Somebody love the Lord said a great big amen. Can you give the Lord one more hand of praise this morning? Because He's worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated this morning. God bless you. Mm. Thank you, worship team. That just felt good. We got good worship here anyway, but that just felt good. That felt good today. It is so good to have you with us. If this is your first time or first time in a long time here at Poe and Assembly. We just want to say thank you for being here. It's our privilege to have you. If you're looking for a home church, we'd like to suggest this one. If you got a home church, thank you for coming. Go back home because we want you to be faithful to your church. Have you know we're not the only church out there. But we want to be a church that our community can come to and find Christ. And I'm telling you, I said this last week. When we come to church with an attitude of expectation, God will show up. He will show up. When we come to church with an attitude of, Lord, have your way, He will. He will. So thank you for letting the Lord move on you this morning Pastor Brad why don't you come we were looking for a youth pastor about three years ago and uh, man we had put the fleece out there and and when you got a lot of work and no pay boy nobody wants to show up Uh, um, I remember one time my wife and I we were being interviewed by by a pastor and his wife and, and it was a pioneer church it wasn't that old so there really wasn't any kind of a paycheck to it. And they said, we can't offer you anything but hard work and a lot of it. And that's it. I even know sometimes it's not about what I get. It's about, Lord, I need a chance to give. And I appreciate this young man. And uh, came to us all by himself. And uh, he, he's, he's kind of like Jacob. Came in with nothing. He's leaving with everything. And uh, just don't take my goats with you. <laughs> take your own goats. Love this brother. Easter of 2012. Sure. Yeah. Sounds right. Well, Close enough. Brad came in. We introduced him as, because we were, remember we were at the school over here having Easter service. Brad came in. We introduced him as our youth pastor. Got a little bit different uh, move in his life, in his ministry, because how do you know God moves us? God does. Just like God moved us from one church to come here to a beautiful place called Poen, God is moving the Newtons to another field and, uh, and possibly a, a whole new work uh, outside of youth going into a whole new field of ministry. And uh, so I appreciate this, brother. And the reason, the reason for tonight having Zane preach is because uh, I wanted to do something to honor you and your wife that uh, I didn't get and I would have loved to have had. But as you close out, Possibly youth ministry as you know it for the rest of your career. I want you to leave with this. To hear one of your own that you have mentored and that you have led. So that you can have a proud moment and say, I had a part to play in that. If he stinks, then you can deny it and say, that's all his daddy. (laughs) That's all his daddy. Stretch your hands out towards Pastor Brad right now, would you? Father God, thank you for this man. Minister through him. Let your anointing be upon him. 
Say what it is that you need to say, Lord God, through him. And give us the ears to hear, the mind to accept, and the heart to walk it out. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. Give Pastor Brad a great big welcome. All right. Um, I've got to get my phone out because, you know, we can't do anything these days with our phones. And honestly, it's hard for me to preach without being able to control it myself because I just don't trust Jamie in the sound booth apparently. But um, while that's coming up, I just want to say thank you to, uh, to Pastor and Sister Andrew because if you don't know anything about my past, I've been divorced and in churches, that's the unforgivable sin most times. And so they took a chance on, well, at that time on me when no one else would. And you as well took a chance on me. And I just want to say thank you for that because, you know, I myself had given up on ministry and given up on that. And uh, thank you for showing me that, that God wasn't done with me as I knock everything over in the, in the church. But uh, looks like this is about up. But Today, I want to ask you just a few simple questions. I, I'm not going to preach long because my dad taught me a long time ago when I first started preaching. He said, son, if you can't reach them in 15 minutes, you're not going to do it in an hour and a half. So you're probably going to get out of here around 12 still, even though we just finished worship. But uh, today, the first question I want to ask you is, can we prove the Bible wrong? And the reason I want to ask you that is because there's a scripture in Luke 4 and 24 that says, and he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. And so since this is my hometown, I'm not saying I'm a prophet, but this is where I'm from. So you can either choose to believe that scripture and not listen to a word I say today, or you can actually listen to what God has for you and, and take it all in. That's your choice. I have no control over it, but... A little bit about me and about my wife is we love Netflix, like a lot. How many of y'all like Netflix? You're a Netflix family. You, you get on the couch and you start with one and then like seven hours later the sun's coming up and you're like, oh crap, I've got to go to work. That's, that's kind of our family sometimes. We, we take advantage of that 15 seconds you have to, to start the next show or turn it off and we're like, oh, it started. I have to watch it now. And so... With that in mind, a lot of TV shows have this disclaimer. They say, at the end of the show, if this looks like you at all, it wasn't our, our intention. And so today, if anything in this message looks like you, it hurts your feelings, it, you think, oh, he's preaching right at me and he thinks something about me and I'm not saved, well, sorry. That's not my intention. This isn't about you. This is just what God said for me to tell you and, you know, if it hurts your feelings, get over it, I guess. I can, I'm, you know, fire me if you want to. I can say what I want today. So, <laughs> today we're going to talk about spiritual sickness in America. Um, there's a lot, I'm going to move this out of the way because it annoys me. As I said before, you can fire me if you want to, I don't care. But, uh, you know, spiritual sickness in America is, is becoming a, an issue America is spiritually sick. There's no doubt about it. There's no getting around it. That's, it's a fact. Would you all agree with me on that? We're going to start here in Ephesians 5 and 27. That he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. That's not a very good represent, representation of what the church is today. Holy and blameless, is it? I would say that the Church of America, you know, there's churches out there, and I'm not talking about this building, our church family. I'm talking about church in general, not the Assemblies of God in general, church in general, Assemblies of God, Baptist, Methodist, as Christianity in general is the, the picture that I'm representing to you today because we're more than Poen. We're more than Arkansas. We're more than the Assemblies of God. We are Christians. And as Christians, this is the picture that we need to look at. And so, as the very spiritual core of our country has been infected, 4,000 churches opened last year, but 7,000 were closed. There's an issue with that. Why are we opening so many churches when we're closing so many churches? 
1,700 ministers leave the ministry every month. And that's not what I'm doing. I'm going to go ahead and clarify that. I'm, I've heard that I've got like six different jobs and three different churches, and we're not going anywhere to any different church. We're going to visit a lot. But uh, to go ahead and clarify that publicly and across the Internet, we are not coming to your church to preach there. We're just visiting churches. But, uh, sorry, I get that question a lot. Hey, I heard you're going here. I heard you're going there. No, we're not. But uh, 1,700 ministers leave the ministry each month, never to return again. Hopefully, one day soon, God will allow us back in the ministry. So, again, that's not us, but, you know, 1,700 each month. Something's wrong with that. Why do 1,700 leave each month? 1,300 ministers were terminated each month. Some for just cause, I'm sure. I don't think all of them. 3,500 people, not ministers, just people, you guys, leave the church. Why? Can anyone answer that? I couldn't. Well, I can, but y'all, wouldn't, y'all don't like the answers. 50% of ministers last less than five years. Zane, great example of that. He will start his ministry very shortly. He's already started. He preaches a lot because I didn't have that opportunity and I wanted him to. But five years from now, according to this statistic, he won't have a chance in ministry if he falls on that 50% line. He'll either be here or he won't. Why is that? Only one in ten will retire as a minister. Why is that? Pastor, you you have a one in ten chance of doing this when you're 70. I have a one in ten chance of doing this when I'm 70. Zane, all the other pastors in here, not all of us according to to this, we'll make it. We'll have other jobs. We will be completely out of ministry. And a lot of times when pastors get out of ministry, they don't follow Jesus anymore because of the hurt and the pain and the stories that are behind it. And so how do we cure this sickness? How do we cure what is ripping the church apart from within? Anyone have any answers? Like, like doctors do, you can treat the symptoms all day long. If you've got a cough, you can treat a cough. If you've got a runny nose, you can wipe it. But until you get to the core problem, until you get to the virus or the bacteria or whatever it is that's causing these things in your life, you're going to be wiping your nose for a long time, right? And so as a church, we have to find out what the problem is. We have to do more than hire a new pastor. We have to do more than recruit somebody from someone else's church. We have to do more than what we're doing right now. And again, I'm not sending this to any one person in here. I'm saying this is the Church of America today. This is everyone. This is me, because I've been guilty of it. I thought, man, they would be awesome in our church, man, because they can play the guitar and feel lives closer. And man, that would be awesome. And then what happens? We start pulling people from other churches and lateral growth is not growth because until the church as a whole grows, nobody grows. Until we get the people off the street that aren't going to church anywhere, all we're doing is putting cows from one barn to another, from one field to another. You know, I, I grew up watching my papa and my dad raise cows and it was always neat to, to see all these cows in one field. I'm like, man, we got a bunch of cows. And they're like, no, they're just not at the deer camp anymore. Now they're in our yard. Now they're in this field. And then the same was true. All of a sudden, all of our cows were gone. And it's like, man, they sold all the cows. That, 
Or maybe they butchered them and now I'm going to get to eat a lot of steak. I don't know. But that's not what happened. They would just move from one field to another. The population of cows was still the same. The population of Christians, still the same. They're just in a different church. And so until we learn to treat the problem instead of the symptoms, we're not doing anything but wiping our own nose. So let's look at some of the symptoms today, and then let's see, or I'm going to present this to you. You can do with it what you want. If this looks like you, you might want to listen to God on that. If it doesn't, then it's probably the person sitting beside you, okay? So 1,700 ministers leave each month. We have two choices in this, and these are all the choices that I'm going to present to you today are kind of what I see the church doing, the, the people doing. It's not what you're doing and individually. This is what the Church of America, I see, as a whole doing. And so as a church, we could, A, we could forget about these people. If they couldn't make it in ministry, it's not our fault. It's not our fault that, that they got mad when we act the way we do as a church and they left. Who cares? They're, it's their chosen profession. They choose every day to be a pastor. They choose every day to do this. And if I get mad and I quit at the school, that doesn't, no one comes and looks at me any different. Why should I care any more about them? And so we've got that choice, and that's what a lot of churches, and that's what a lot of denominations do. They, it's not our fault. They're an individual. They have that right, because this is America, and we have rights, and we're going to stand on them. And if they want to leave, God bless them, and we'll see you later. Or we could stop forcing our spiritual leaders to live up to standards that we ourselves refuse to. If you're not going to live up to a standard, why should pastor have to? If it's sin for him, shouldn't it be sin for you? If it's sin for me, it's sin for you. If it, you know, there's, there's a scripture that says, let, let each man work out his own salvation, but sin is sin. There's a few things, few minor things that, that may convict you that don't convict me and vice versa, but for the most part, sin is sin. If, it's, if you're going to gripe at pastor for doing it, well, for one, do it to his face. Get off Facebook. Quit gripping to your friends. Quit gossiping and, and go face him like a man or a woman. Come face me like a man or a woman because that's biblical. The Bible says, doesn't it? So let's look at symptom number two. And as I I mentioned earlier, we got eight minutes left, so let's, let's get going. But symptom number two is 3,500 people will leave a church. Why are so many people leaving our churches? Why are so many people sick of sitting beside you? Why is it so hard to stay in church today? So we could, we could do this. What so many of us are continually doing every day is we could keep gossiping about all the deep sin that those people are in and we could keep praying for them and you know bringing them up in prayer group oh did you hear we need to pray because because they're man they're living in the world and we could keep doing that couldn't we it's what we do anyway as a church isn't it when when someone leaves instead of you know maybe finding out why they left we could actually take the time to figure out what what we're doing that causes so many to be sickened at what the Church of America has become. That's why people leave. It's not because the preaching isn't good. It's not because the worship isn't good. It's because they're sick of the church. They're sick of the community group and the, the cliques. And I've been in some of the best churches in Arkansas and... It's like you're at the world's biggest high school because you've got this group over here, the cheerleaders, and, oh, they're all together, and then you've got this group over here that they're all together, and, well, those two don't ever do anything because that might, it might look bad if, 
if this group was to associate with that group, and then when you go to a fellowship, you've got this group that sits over here, and they do their own thing, and you've got this group that sits over here, and they do their own thing. And that's why people are sick of it. People want a real relationship. People want truth. People want love. People want something that they can't get anywhere else. And when they come to church and all they see is gossip and all they see is hurt and all they see is people stabbing each other in the back so that they can get a new position and so they can look better than you and they say, oh, I give this much an offering. Oh, I did this. I bought that. People don't care. People don't want to know what you've done. People want to know Jesus saves, Jesus loves, and Jesus wants to love me. And until we can stop arguing amongst ourselves and show people that, we're going to continue wiping our nose. We're going to continue stealing people from other churches to fill our church, and then that church is going to close. Oh, but we've got, we opened all these new churches this year. Yeah, but you closed more than that because you're just taking people from one field and putting them in another. And so let's, let's keep going. I've got five minutes left, so we're, we're doing good because we're almost done. But there's a sin that tears apart our nation. Not one sin, it's many sins. And it, they're ripping us apart, and we can continue to do nothing about it. Or we can do what the church was designed to do. We could stand up. We could quit fighting amongst ourselves. And we could voice our opinion and say, this is what we believe. This is why we believe what we believe. And that's our opinion. Everyone else does it. People with a lesser population, they stand up and they voice their opinion and laws get passed. There's more Christians in America than there are, well, there's more people that say they're Christian in America. But we could continue to blame the government, church leadership, the president, that's a big one. Some of you all blame the president for everything. Well, if we didn't have the president, it's not his fault. And if you don't like him, go vote. But we, we tend to blame everyone but ourselves. Myself included. I've, and I've, I've been that way. We're quick to jump on someone else and we're quick to say, well, if Mr. Newton wasn't at the school, then, then that place would be good. Then we'd have a state championship in football. It's all his fault. Well, he's... You know, whatever. I can do that because he's my dad. And he can get mad at me if he wants to, but I, he'll get over it. It's what he always told me when I was growing up. Oh, you'll get over it, won't you? And still have some deep, deep emotional <laughs> scarring from growing up in that household of, of love and support. It was just, it was painful, let me tell you. But... Um, how about we wake up and take a look at ourselves and stop being the church of Matthew 21? Some of y'all need to look up that church, Matthew 21. Not right now, but take some time and study it because that's the church of today. That's the church that we're in right now. And so, Freddie, why don't you dim the lights and Daniel, do your thing with music. And I love these guys. They're, they're, they're awesome. But today as a church, as an individual, we need to examine ourselves. You know, I had a, a different message all planned out and keynotes everywhere. I mean, it was awesome. I was, I was loving it because it was, it was a great message and lots of animations and it was just, it was cool. But yesterday God said, no, I don't want you to preach that. I want you to preach this. I said, God, I don't want to preach that. That's tough. People don't want to hear that. People want to see the animations, and they want to see the videos, and they want to be entertained. He says, but I don't want them entertained. I want them to, to look at themselves. I want them to see what they have become. And while you individually may not be any of these things, I personally 
was a lot of them. Because I would continually blame other people for the problems in my life, for the problems of America. And I would say, man, if we just had, if we had a different government, if we had this that was different, if we had someone different in leadership here, if we had someone different in leadership there, then God, then you could really move. But God began to, to show me that he's not limited by who's in power. God's limited by us. And until we allow God to do what he wants to do, what's going to happen? Not a thing. And so today I'm going to open up the altars and this isn't for everyone because I know some of you are perfect and I know some of you don't have any sin and I strive to be like you one day because you're awesome. But for the rest of us, we have sin. We're not perfect. We are the church. And we are sick spiritually. We, we don't eat our vegetables like our mom told us to. Our spiritual vegetables of our daily prayer and our daily time in the word that keep us healthy that keep us from having to go to the doctor all the time and some of us need to examine that some of us need to change our lifestyle as your medical doctor would say as as a spiritual doctor I can say that now because I you, worst you can do is fire me and I don't get to come back tonight but as a spiritual doctor you need to eat your vegetables. You need to change your lifestyle. You need to do the things that make you healthy. Read your Bible. Pray. Spend time with God. If you're not doing those things, you're going to be like the people in the, the electric carts at Walmart that have absolutely nothing wrong with them other than they're so big they can't walk. Some of us are that person spiritually. There's nothing wrong with you. You have all the capabilities to walk spiritually. You just choose not to. So if everyone would bow your heads and no one's looking around and not going to beg, not going to plead because it's your choice. But if that's you, why don't you come forward? Why don't you find the spiritual life that you're looking for. It's myself, I had to examine myself and I fell short on so many of these things. 